try that again. Good morning, church. God is good. And all the time. Amen. We got a lot to be grateful and a lot to be thankful for. Amen. I'm really excited by starting a, a new series here I want to do. Uh, my wife suggested to me, and I started reading up on it, and I got excited about it. It's called the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And when Jesus grew up on the mountainside, he teaches. And uh, it's uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew. And each day, I'm going to do a chapter each week. This Sunday, chapter 5, the week after 6, and then 7. And I just pray to God that uh, I do it some justice, because it is said by the Sermon on the Mount that there is no sermon in the Bible that's been reduplicated and preached and talked about and shared more than any other sermon in the whole Bible. And uh, just doing some history and looking up on it, you'll learn why. <clears throat> Jesus went up on a mountainside and got up high enough to speak to thousands to teach them. Thank you, brother. And so um, I want to set us up and talk about all that happened there. But before I read, I did a little homework and I'm going to share it with you. So the first part of my message, I want you to close your Bibles. I just want you to sit still and listen. Because we're not going to be reading out the Bible, the first part. We're going to be, I'm going to tell you a little bit of history and what theologians have said about the Sermon on the Mount. And then the second part of my message, we're going to open our Bible and read. And now when you read, it's going to make even more sense to you. See, sometimes you need to know what you're reading about and what, what, what you're supposed to be learning. And so we're going to talk about and give you some history, like a history class. <laughs> kind of tell you some things that was going on at the time. That when Jesus preached the lesson, my God, my God, it'll make more sense to you. So let's go for a ride. Let's go back in the, in the day. The Sermon on the Mount. Some things that some theologians said and some people said, I want us to read that first and then we're going to read the scriptures. What makes the Sermon on the Mount challenging? Even difficult at times. It's calling you to undivided loyalty. Jesus is saying, I want you to be a fully devoted follower of me. There is nothing in this, this sermon that's part time or part way. It's all or nothing. And that's exactly the point that Jesus is making. That's right. A part of having a wholehearted commitment means that you don't just believe the truth but you obey them. Or if you can't, if we can flip that, that statement on his head, being a fully devoted disciple not only means that you obey them ex externally, but that you actually believe them internally from both directions. Amen. You understand that the Sermon on the Mount is what, it, what it's all about. Amen. To put in our language, it's not enough to just go to church and sit in the pew. That's right. Every time the doors open. Right. It's not enough to dress up nicely and then give your money when the offering goes by. None of that is what meets God's standards. It's the heart that shows itself in right action. That's what God requires. In a nutshell, that's what is going on in chapter 5 of the Sermon of the Mount. And then some other theologians said this. So, let's read. Celebrities have replaced authentic heroes today. Cele celebrities enjoy wealth, admiration, and notoriety. They appear on life-size posters in teenagers' bedrooms. Dot the covers of popular magazines and appear in ads on the internet. Celebrities show us what is hip and what is past. They tell us what we should eat, drink, drive, and wear. And many people dutifully obey them. Celebrities owe their lofty status more to advertisement, sponsor, and media exposure than to noble qualities of their character. Yet when high school students in Brooklyn, New York, were asked in a school of thousands what they will most likely be when they grow up, 
Two thirds in the school said a celebrity. Jesus was not even an afterthought. The greatest man that ever lived. But our media and all that goes on, our kids want to be a celebrity. As I was reflecting on how thus as much as young people have gone gaga over Lady Gaga, I read the word of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Does Jesus not understand that to attract followers and boost your numbers, you need star status? Surely he would attract more media attention if he taught instead. Blessed are the wealthy. Blessed are the beautiful. Blessed are the almighty. And blessed are the dollar. Today, we're going to look at Jesus on the mount. Amen. He has gathered followers, began his uh, ministry with healing, and now he sits down with the crowd to share his wisdom. When Jesus speaks, he's not teaching middle class citizens who are frustrated with a few inconvenience of life. He is addressing his fellow Jews who must endure the, op the occupation of Roman troops in a political and economic system that forced them to par into poverty. There are not people struggling to eke out a decent living. They're straining to survive one more day. These people live in fear beneath a regime, regime that has no qualms about executing anyone who steps out of line. The Romans view such killings as an opportunity to remind those who, who live on their property or occupy their land uh, the importance of resisting the Roman Empire that you must not. Threat of death is the essence of Rome. Rome peace was not an ideal in which weapons of war were beaten into ag agriculture tools and people were free to respectfully disagree with the government. Rather, the Romans equated peace with order and obedience. Right. Roman troops maintained peace by crushing all opposition. Right. In what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks to people who are struggling to survive foreign domination and believe that their desperation is a clear sign that God is punishing them. It is to people who live in poverty, who live in fear, who believe that their plight, plot is punishment from the Almighty, that Jesus says, blessed are you. The words of Jesus must have been so startling, startling that many thought they had misunderstood him. <laughs> Imagine someone shouting, what? Can you repeat that? <laughs> Instead of sharing a sharp reprimand, instead of saying, you are getting what you deserve, Jesus says, blessed are you. This morning reading contains the open, opening words of Jesus sermon known as the Beatitudes. He pronounced nine blessings which function in two ways. First, they declare God's favor on people who suffer. And second, they illustrate those actions that are in harmony with divine desires. They serve as both a word of comfort and a word of challenge. New Testament scholars said the beatitude consists of two groups. The first four are bound together by illustration of the Greek letter pi. Unfortunately, when the words are translated into English, the illustration sometimes is lost. A rough equivalent would be bless of the poor, the plaintiff, the powerless, those who pine for righteousness. Carter said these four beatitudes describe not personal qualities, but oppression, oppressive situation of distress, which are honored because they will be revered in God's kingdom. This reversal is now underway in Jesus ministry, but it's not yet completed. When Jesus tells the people that they are blessed, he is not saying that they should plaster on a smile and whistle at a tune. He is saying that despite their afflictions, they could be confident that God cares deeply for them. And one day their fortunes will be reversed. Right. It is an assurance of comfort. It is a message of encouragement. It is, it is a simple promise of hope. Mm 
The first blessing, according to Matthew's gospel, is blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Some of you know that the Beatitudes also appear in Luke's gospel, but in slight difference form. According to Matthew, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. But according to Luke, Jesus said simply, blessed are the poor. Well-off Christians generally prefer Matthew's version. Many are not keen on the idea that God would side with people who are poor. All of us seek to relate the words of Jesus directly to ourselves. And while we may not know poverty, we know that what it is to have depressed spirits or an anemic spiritual life. Sure. The first Christians likely saw little difference between Matthew and Luke's versions. Jesus was undoubtedly seeking to pe speaking to people who were desperately poor and whose spirit were crushed by the tyranny under, the, under the, which they labored. In saying they were blessed, Jesus was saying, do you think you deserve this? Do not think this is what God wants for you. God loves you and you can find comfort in God. Although your current situation is, di is dire, your affliction will not last forever. God will vindicate you in the future. Amen. Most of us might admit, might admit that such a blessing is not totally satisfactory. We want God to eliminate poverty, pain, and injustice. What do, you, do, what do we want it? When do we want it? We want it now. However, it, it, however, in a world where people are free to make choices, we must live with the consequence of good and bad decisions. Right. Jesus told the crowd they were blessed, blessed because their broken spirit would one day be healed. Amen. Amen. Such a blessing was empowering because it assured them that God was on their side and opposed it to those forces of injustice. Jesus also said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus was not raising suffering to a virtue. He was refuting the popular notion of this day that those who suffer are being punished by God. Jesus said exactly the opposite. He said, God will comfort you who mourn. Your sorrow is not unnoticed. You are not alone. God is with you. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Does God want us to shrivel in the face of injustice, faint in the face of evil? Hardly. Jesus addressed people who possess minuscule power and little control of their destiny. Jesus was saying that although... They were victims of, dark, of a dark force that yield mighty power in the end. Brute force would not win the day. Although they were currently under the fist of a ruthless power in God's kingdom, the roles will be reversed. The fourth beatitude is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus said righteousness not self-righteousness. He was not urging people to believe that they were better than others. It was not a, it was not, it was blessings those who whom justice was denied and access to vital resources was limited. He was blessings those who had little reason to remain hopeful, yet they had not given up in despair. They continue to yearn for the, for the world God envisions, a world where people look out for each other, where generosity flows like a river, where virtue succeed and remain on top, and where justice thrives in every community. Amen. Beatitudes. Five through nine represented second, yet they moved away from circumstances people experiencing to action God challenged us to take. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. They, the world knows too much cruelty, intolerance, and harshness. Christ counseled us to counter meanness with mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. If our heart are pure, we gain a clarity of vision that draws us closer to God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Strife and violence are tearing our, our world apart. The current divide in our country seems fueled by people who become so convinced of their own virtue and the vice of their opponents that they have no desire for reconciliation. The only, they only want to impose their way on others. 
Blessed are those who persecute for righteousness' sake, for there is the kingdom of heaven. People who take up a just cause discover that, there, that the opposition can be fierce. Someone is benefiting from the injustice and they will fight to keep their advantage. The easy path is to say that I am but one small voice, little power to implement change. Jesus blesses those who are persecuted for having the tenacity to stand for what is right. Yeah. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. If you strive to live in, as Christ lived, you will be at odds with the values of our culture and may become a target. Okay. Feeling the things feeling that things were falling apart. Listen to this now, as I bring this section to a close. Feeling that things were falling apart, despite having given his best efforts, Martin Luther King prayed. He cried. He prayed. And something happened. King said that night, he heard the voice of Christ consoling him and telling him not to be afraid. After that, King accused the, accepted the fact that this struggle was going to be the heart of his ministry. He tackled segregation laws with more vigor than before and soon embrace peaceful nonviolent tactics a critical peace actor said that when he visited King in early 1956 King six King's house was filled with a armor and arsenal of weapons but after the kitchen in Pippity, King gave up the guns saying they had to go if he was going to follow God's agenda no one confused the Beatitudes with nine tips to sell Celebrate status, celebrity status. They will not make you wealthy or powerful unless you understand wealth and as riches that cannot be bought, and power as the courage and unwavering determination to conquer darkness with light. Amen. Amen. In closing, this section. To be blessed is to live with an unquenchable hope that in the long arc of history, justice will prevail because love is more powerful than hate, peace more com covenant than strife. So blessed are you who live a Christ-like life of compassion because even though it may attract persecution, in the end, the way of God will triumph. The way of God will win. Now let's read the Beatitudes in chapter 5. Listen to God's word. That was theologians talking about all the, 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 the scriptures stand for and what they were there about. Giving us some time, helping us make sure we understand that as we begin to read that back in the day, what they were standing against. When we, with the way we look at poverty, <laughs> Boy, some of us need to go to a third world country and learn what poverty really is. It is not what we think. Third world country think we're wealthy and filthy rich. You got to think about what was going on then as Jesus went up the mountain to give the word of God to people. Who was torn down and had saw no hope. But Jesus came to give them hope. Let's read. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the people Peacemaker, for they would be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Listen here, Jesus, can you understand when, 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 the, when the theologian said that some people in the crowd looked up and say, huh? You know what they're doing to me? You know, they killed my family because I claim that I want to read the Bible and learn about you. Do you understand what they're doing to me? He said, blessed are you who've been persecuted because of me. That's right. For there is the kingdom of heaven. That's right. yeah. Come on, bro. And yet... 
what we complain about today. The things that we make more bigger than what they really are. The challenge that we go through of today in our walk with God. Yet, we don't read our Bibles every day. We don't pray every day. And we say we're Christians. How easy we struggle with one another. A struggle in situations. How we let our jobs rob us of God. Our money and the different things rob us. We allow that to take God from us. We make school and education more important than God. We forget that what you have, my God gave it to you. That's right. That's right. And God give it, and my God can take it away. Right. How so easily we forget. Yeah. Let's read verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses saltness, how can it be made salt, salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on the foot. In verse 14 of chapter 5, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. He's telling, they struggle. He's saying, don't y'all know that you are the light of the world? And they looking at Jesus like, my man, look at him, man, I ain't got nothing. I'm poor and despair. And you're trying to say that I am the light of the world? Jesus as Christians, we are the light. Amen. Our light should not be made brighter because the car we drive. Our light should not be made brighter because what kind of house we live in. Our light should not be made brighter if we wear a suit to church or not. Our clothes should not dictate our light. The only thing, your light should be bright because of God and God alone and nothing else. We must gain these convictions. Yeah. We shouldn't walk around our head high because we got a job and it's above everybody else around us. So our head held high. Right. Let your head be held high because of God. Because right. that little job you got, he gave it to you. That's right. We must grow in these convictions. I have no desire to lead thousands upon thousands to hell. Right. Right. We must grow in this. Right about who God is. And this is what was going on in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus teaching. Look at verse 15 again. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. We are a light. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Think about what he said to them now. The, the people, all that they're going through and the tyranny of Romans beating and taking everything they got. He say, let your light shine. When they see that you're still happy and have nothing, they will give God glory. We got to really grow in these convictions and not let our joy come for how big our bank account is. How many vacations we can go on. How many kids we got and how our kids got all the latest technology. All the iPads and the, and the new iPhone 8, 55, V4, 3 on the side. <laughs> they got all the new technology. I, 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 I called for help one day and they say, well, what about this? I said, ma'am, I just know how to push the button, turn the phone on. And make a call. That is all I know how to do. But it's amazing to me. Our children know all the technology of this world. Our children can take an iPhone and open up and tell you everything about it. But our children cannot tell us nothing about God. We must not build people like that. We must not have a household that can tell us everything about this world. But when it comes to God, we're not that light on the hill. For the RCC, we're going to be the light on the hill. We're going to call all of us to know God. All of us to get in the word. Because we want God to be glorified. Verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will be, will, will by any means disappear. 
from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teachers, teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practice and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpass that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. My God, you know who the Pharisees are and the teachers of the law? Back then, those are people, they thought they knew everything about God. Religious people. But hypocrites. A bunch of hypocrites. God says, man, you best not be a hypocrite. Do not be like those. So we're going to have to learn to be who we say we are. Don't say you are a Christian, you go home, you sleep with everybody and their mama. That's right. That's right. Don't say you're a Christian and you go home and you cussing everybody out. Right. Using a finger and flipping everybody a bird. But yet you say you're a Christian. Don't say you're a Christian and yet your second language is profanity. That is not Christianity. That's what the fact, that's hypocrisy. And we must not allow ourselves to become that. We got to be more than that. He said, man, we must not be nothing like the Pharisees. Let's read on verse 21. The sermon, he just breaks it down. Now he goes into murder. You heard that it was said to the people long ago, you should not murder. And anyone who murders would be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister would be subject to judgment. Oh my God. He went from murder to, oh, I'm going to tell you something else. Oh, you think murdering is bad? Then be mad at your brother and sister. I would count as just as equal. We have no right to be angry towards each other. That's right. It is a sin, is it wrong? We got to get resolved. Who said it this morning? Was saying, you got to not even, even the community was saying, be resolved with those around you. God says it's wrong. You can't harbor feelings because it will destroy you and destroy those who listen to you. Again, anyone who says to my brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, would be a danger of the fire of hell. The Greek word is Raka, R-E-K-A. And it means you don't go around calling people empty-headed or foolish. God says, don't you dare do that. Speak that of each other. You fool. You empty-headed. God says, you will not do that. In verse 23, therefore I tell you, or offering you get the offering you gift at the altar, and therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary, who is talking, taking you to court. Do it while you are still together in the, on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge. Man, I love what God says here. Look at it. In verse 24, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary. God says, man, we got to settle matter quickly if there's an issue. You know, what I learned from reading and studying this out, I've always had this conviction. And God has changed my heart on this. And Vinny has taught me, talked to me, and taught, my wife has taught me this before too. You know, if I have an issue with you, I'm gonna always go to you, and I'm gonna aim to resolve my issue. But if you have an issue with me or anybody else, it's your responsibility to go to them. But the scripture just took it to a whole nother level. He said, if you know they have an issue, oh my God. And he, he didn't say just, if, if I got an issue with Carol, I go to Carol, and if Carol got an issue with me, should he come in? He says that. But then he says, if you know they have an issue, go get it resolved. Go, go, go get it resolved. If they, not not just you have an issue, but if you know they have an issue with you, go to them. Yeah. Say, what's up? What's going on? Mm -hmm. 
That's the I know you. So what's going so what's on? Let's get this resolved. That's what the Bible said. You know, and I used to I used to feel like, well, if they got this, that's on them. They want to go to hell, go to hell. I ain't got time for I'm gonna go I'm gonna do I'm gonna do what's right. I ain't got time for this stuff. I don't have no issue. They got an issue. So let them go to hell. That's what they choose. See, because we choose to have feelings and issues. That's just a choice. But we got to love each other enough to though if they, you know your brother or sister have, have some feelings, go the extra mile to help them resolve it. If they choose not to resolve it, now it's really on them. And my God will deal with them. But you got to have a clear conscience. You can't be saying, man, I ain't got no issue with them. They got an issue with me, so I, I, I don't have no issue with them. But when you find out that they have an issue, take it to them. Sit down and open the Bible and say, let's talk. And this got to get resolved. And then if it still don't get resolved, bring your deacons and bring your evangelists involved with it. If it still don't get resolved because they don't want to get resolved, you need to know this. So help me God or let me die, I will expel them. The Bible tells me to. If they refuse to be resolved. He expects us to get resolved. And not have feelings towards one another. Or whatsoever. Amen. The world... Come on, let's be real. World, you got an attitude, man. Hey, man I, wish, I wish you would come knock on my door. Right. You stay over there, I'm going to stay over here. Don't cross the line. Yeah. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Yeah. So they don't get resolved. Yeah. But we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Yeah. That's what that's talking about. We must be the example and be the light, amen? Yeah. They must see Jesus in us. Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, let's look at verse 27. You heard that it was said, you should not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery right. with her in his heart. Right. If your eye, right eye calls you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand calls you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Right. Jesus is teaching in thousands. Yeah. They're in despair. Romans are just treating them bad. <laughs> and Jesus said, no, but let's deal with you. We're going to talk about what you doing. Your walk with God. Say, I don't want any adultery among you guys out there. That's right. And you better not be walking around lusting for somebody else's woman. He just breaks it down. He says, oh, yo, oh, because because they can't see it, but know that I see it. See, that's how we got to live our lives, that people might cannot see what you do, but God sees what you do. That's why it just amazes me when I study Bible with people who say they want to become Christians. See, if you say you want to become a Christian... You need to know one thing. God sees everything you do. It's not about trying to please me or anybody else. My goal is just to open the Bible and show you the truth. But then if you're not responding to the truth, and, and, and for some reason you're on shaky ground, it's not my job to play, what's that game called? Battleship. B8. Miss. C3. Miss. F2. Hit. Ding, 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 ding. F5, miss. Like, I got to figure out what's wrong with you. Right. It's our responsibility to be open and say, this is where I'm at. I know when I studied the Bible, I had to say, look, I avoided studying the Bible because I knew the Bible would tell me I couldn't have sex with a bunch of women no more. So I wouldn't study the Bible. But I had to come to the convictions that I no longer want to live that way anymore. And then when I decided I didn't want to live that way anymore, I had to say, okay, now, I mean, I can't steal no more. I can't lie, cheat. I know I ain't want to read. That's why I ain't want to read the Bible. But when I got tired of my life, I read the Bible. I said, okay, I'm going to change. And I changed. I was 21 years old and decided, okay, I'm ready to change my life. I'm not living that way anymore. I'm coming up on 55, so that'd be what, 34 years later? I'm still standing. I did not live that way anymore. Amen. I got married. I never committed adultery on my wife. Amen. I stayed faithful because of God, not because of my wife, because I read my Bible. 
See, we've got to come to conviction about what the Bible says. We've got to get to the point where we read the Bible, it does something to our hearts. Too many times, and I'm still confused, our young people, it blows my mind. Our young people, can, a, a song come on the radio, oh, that's my song, that's my song. <laughs> they get all into it. Yeah. But they open the Bible and they go, oh, this is boring. We're we gonna get done. They go to church and they all, oh, okay, are we done yet? Are we? <laughs> the word of God is not doing anything to our people's hearts. Yeah. And family, moms and dads, you better take responsibility. What are you teaching them at home? Listen, Michael Jackson and Tupac Shakur and, and what's the other people name that's alive? They ain't got nothing on the word of God. They ain't got nothing on the word of God. You guys, like the guy talk about these celebrities, they're the bomb to you. And I can't figure out why. And yet none of them can walk on water. Come on now. None of them can turn water into wine. Come on now. Oh, they can slam dunk a basketball. LeBron James. Really? Really? Don't you know God is above the rim at all times? He allowed that ball to go in. And even adults, we got to get a grip of what we call who, who we chasing after. We got to hear Jesus on that mountainside saying, "Come, follow me." Yes. Amen. Well, let's read on. Go oh, out. I have a few little bit further to go. We're almost done with chapter 5. Saving 6 for next week. Divorce, he talks about. It has been said, anyone who dis divorces his wife must give her certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. Anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Amen. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath. Here we go. But fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is for it is his footstool or by Jerusalem for it is the city of the great king and do not swear by your head for you cannot make even one hair white or black white or black all you need to say is simply yes or no anything beyond that comes from the evil one wow. okay that's pretty straightforward I swear to God you have lost your mind I do that now let's see how many y'all gonna tell the truth how many have ever done that in your life raise your hand that's it you can't be doing stuff like that no that, no that, that's wrong I'm, I promise I'm gonna get it done I, I swear to you why can't you just be I get it done and then you go get it done that's what the Bible says let your yes be yes and your no be no God said have some character convictions we must be a people that hold the godly convictions and let our yes be yes and our no be no. Look what it says here in verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person but i tell you do not resist an evil an evil person if anyone slaps you on the right cheek turn it them to the other cheek also and this is why it took so long for me to become a christian <laughs> that wasn't in the bible i added that you understand what we just read yeah. 
Oh, no, I know you don't. Let me read it again. You don't, you don't understand it. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, pow, turn to the other one and cheek, turn them the other cheek. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your, uh, take your shirt, hand over, over, hand over your coat as well. <laughs> they slap you, give them the other cheek. Yeah. They want to sue you, take your coat off and give it to them. This is what God says. Can you imagine if we really live like that as a society? God said, I fight your battles. You don't have to worry about it. See, it's where our faith is. Man, somebody shoot a bird as why we block their horn right riding down the street. We turn around and shoot a bird back. Or, or say something mean back. That's wrong. We got to allow people, people go off and want to vent and act a fool on you. You're going to have to learn how to turn a smile and love. Yes, sir. They got to learn what Christianity, who are they going to learn it from? Right. Right. I told you this story before, a true story. This guy owed me $750 years ago. And he decided to keep it without telling me he was going to pay me back. I had to figure out that he wasn't planning on paying me back. So, he was in Chicago and I was in Texas. So I called him, I said, uh, I never got that 750 he was gonna get back to me. Oh, oh well, you know, he came up with this long story. Basically said, man, I, I, I wouldn't really plan on giving it back. Or I, I, I'm not gonna pay you on it. Oh my goodness, now, I got it before God, I'm at church, I gotta admit, tell you, I, I was preaching and I was a Christian. And that's what I said to him, you punk, keep that money and have a good day. I hung up the phone and you know my wife is near. <laughs> Jesus all around me in the house and I thought about it. I said, you know, my God, long story short, I just said, let me repent. It is what it is, I'm gonna move forward. I called that guy back. I said, I was amazed he picked up the phone. I said, hey, this is Marcus. I know who it is. I said, I just want to tell you, I am sorry for what I said to you. That is wrong. And that's not a Christian. And I'm a Christian. Please forgive me. And, uh, and I pray that you have a good day. And he said, man, in all my years, I think we both were about 30, I was, I was 32, I think he was about 38. He said, all my years, I never had a grown man apologize to me. I've never experienced nothing like that. He said, man, I, I respect you more now than before. And I had to guard my heart. I'm like, if you respect me, you gave me my money back. I said, let me, let me leave it alone. I said, I'm, that ain't why I called him back. I said, I'm going to leave that alone. Get out, get out of me, Satan. Cast out. Be gone. I said, I'm going to leave it alone because that is not why I called him back. And uh, he said, well, man, I'm going to give you your money back. I said, well, sir, let me, let me say this to you. I said, sir, because I want to give you his name. I said, um, I didn't call you back to get money back. I call you back because of my own salvation. What I feel, it was wrong. What you do with that, that's your choice. Thank you for forgiving me and have a blessed day. Amen. I hung up. Two days later, two day mail came in, a check for my money, $750. I said, Lord, should I try to cash it or put it in my bank and it bounce? I said, I'm gonna just trust you and just throw it in the bank and not worry about it. It cleared. I shared it with you because that was like getting slapped in me, taken advantage of it. I had to let God deal with it. Amen. We're not always treated right on our jobs right. or in our schools, in our situation. We're going to have to trust God. Right. We don't have to be fighters. Right. Some of us like to fight and argue. <laughs> Got to prove your point. <laughs> you, you, can all, you don't always have to be right. Amen. It's good to be humble and teachable. It's good to forgive and love and encourage and let God to have the last word. Don't always want to have the last word. Don't get into it with somebody. Well, I just want to make sure I, I told you. Well, I told you. Well, I told you. I told you. I told you. Well, who, when you go, who's going to stop? You don't always have to have the last word. We got to le learn to be humble before God. Love, respect, and turn that other cheek and give it over to God and watch what my God do for you. This is the beatitude. You know, can you imagine Jesus telling them this when Roman soldiers go around beating them and killing them? 
And he said, oh, and when they hit your other cheek, turn the other one and give it to them. When they snatch your shoe off you, take your jacket off and hand it to them. They, probably, they thought they thought Jesus was crazy. Jesus says, give it to them. I got you. That's what we got to do as a people. Trust God and let him fight your battles. And we don't have to prove anything to anybody. Just love the Lord with all your heart, might, soul, and strength. In closing, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. My God. Pray for those who put you down. Pray for those who say mean things about you. Pray for those who hate you. That you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward is, will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect. Therefore, as your father in heaven is perfect. God says, man, do more. And we've got to become a people that do more. We got to come with people that have a conviction about sin. If your right hand causes sin, cut it off. Get rid of it. God says, man, we got to get rid of things that cause us to stumble and fall before God. Don't allow things in our hearts to fester. We must gain convictions about our walk with God. The Sermon on the Mount is very practical and very direct. Yes. We got to be willing to accept it. Amen. When we read, what does it do for you? Come on. You read on your own. Does it motivate, inspire, convict, and call higher? Or does it put you to sleep? What goes on when you read? Or the question is, do you even read? Or do you read every now and then? What if God only came in to help you every now and then? We got to stop allowing the word of God to be in our life and yet we do nothing with it. We got to become a people who takes God's words and obey them. That they become a light on the hill for us. A light in our household. A beacon light that keeps us together in our marriages. That teaches us how to raise our children. That allow us to live with joy when we have nothing. Yet we got everything. That helps us walk on water. And yet not sink every time a trap of a sink hole by Satan comes around and it swaddles us in. That we'll be able to stand. Hold our head high because we got God. Feel good about where we are because our relationship with God. Yes. We got to stop feeling good about where we are because what we drive. Right. What house we live in. Where we live at. Right. We got to learn to show no favoritism towards anybody about anything. And be willing to learn from everybody about everything. Right. Because none of us have arrived. That's right. We have not arrived until we get to heaven. Demise, we're not there yet. And I hope to God that we can make it every last one of us. But in order to make it, we got to be willing to accept God's words and obey them. Next week, I'm picking up in part six, part two, chapter six. It, man, Jesus even getting more into it. And as you, we talked about, if you understand the setting and what they were against and hear Jesus' words, my God, I pray that it inspires us even more. Amen. Let's pray. And my singers can come up and sing, my God is awesome, as we close. If you can get on your knees, let's ask God to move our, help move our hearts. Dan, if you can come pray for me. If you got to sit in chairs, okay. Let's go ask God to help our hearts. Thank you, brother. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this message, Father. We thank you for the Sermon on the Mountain that Jesus gave, Father. God, I pray that as we listen this morning, it's just like we were sitting there listening to Jesus' words, Father. God, as Mark read from the scriptures, God, that God, that God, do the scriptures, do they move us, Father? Or we just heard a story? Or was it something that was real to us, Father? God, I, I pray that this morning, God, I pray we don't stop here. I pray we go back through these scriptures, God. And God, let us just examine our hearts, Father. God, I pray that we come to know your word, Father, and that we trust and we believe in it, God. But God, it won't help us unless we read it and understand it and we listen to it. And that when we do listen to it, God, we apply it. Mm. Father, I thank you for giving us Jesus. I thank you that he became one of us. And God, that how the things he, he was saying, God, he understood where the people were at. He knew yes. their oppression, Father. And he understands ours. Whatever we're going through this morning, God, Jesus knows what we're going through. Yes. Because he is alive. He was one of us. He knows what it feels like to be hungry. He knows what it feels like to, not to be low on money. He knows what it feels like to be going through pain and sickness and losing loved ones and all, God anything we can imagine losing a job whatever it may be God he understands it yes but he simply wants to know God that he's take, he's taking it all on for us so that we don't have to carry it Father I pray God that the day can be different for us when we Please, leave God. here that we hold on to your word and we we grab on to the hand of Jesus in Jesus name we pray amen